Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in this video, I would like to explore VGM files, where VGM stands for Video Game Music. Nowadays, computers are fast enough that you can generate whatever music and sound effects you want on the CPU on the fly. But back in the day when CPUs were less powerful, you usually had a separate chip handling sound duties. VGM files are basically a record of the commands that are sent to one of these sound chips. And these can be generated nowadays by tracker software, which is a primitive version of what nowadays would be thought of as a DAW, a digital audio workstation, but it usually just has note data and not separate audio data. If access is available to the raw data files made and delivered with some particular video game, sometimes these VGM files can be converted directly from those original source files. And there's also the possibility of going in and literally measuring the commands that are sent to the chip by looking at the data bus between the CPU and the chip. VGM files can be played back by software that emulates these original chips, or you can also create VGM players that send the appropriate commands to actual real hardware. So a VGM file consists of a header that tells you what kind of chips you are using, what clock rate those chips are being run at, and all sorts of other pieces of information. And after the header, you have a series of commands that usually consist of writing a particular data value to a particular register on a sound chip or some sort of delay. The most common one probably being this 0x61 command where you wait in samples. And the sample rate here in terms of these wait commands is 44.1 kilosamples per second, which incidentally is the rate of CD audio. So I found this VGM tools archive on GitHub. It has all sorts of programs to convert files from different formats to the VGM format or to manipulate VGM files in various ways. So let's go ahead and download the zip file for that. Let's see, download zip, and we'll download that to my working directory. Let's open that up. So we have VGM tools dash master. Why do I have it in this kind of format? don't want this as icons. Let's look at this as a list. Okay, so let's take a look and see what we have. Have a whole bunch of C files. So if I type make, will this just magically work? I have a make file. See, I'm getting a bunch of warnings, but all the compiling seems to be compiling. And it looks like I have a whole bunch of executables. All right. So this is running on my Mac M1, so I'm guessing it compiled for native silicon. If you're a Mac user and you use the Unix side of the Mac operating system a lot, it's very nice to be able to see your usual unix -y folders that the Mac OS usually hides from you when you're looking at them in the Finder. There's a command you can run that will set this up for you. So here I'm gonna to go to user, I'm going to go to local, and I'm gonna bin. And what I want to do is copy these executables to my user local bin folder so I can easily execute them from any terminal window. So let's see. Let's go in here and let's try to sort by application. There we go. So these are all applications as far as OSX is concerned. So let me copy them all into user local bin. Oh, actually, that didn't copy. That full on moved. All right. One program I'm particularly interested in is VGM to text. Oh, so it's asking me for a file name. So let's go get some files. I'm particularly interested in the arcade version of Choplifter. Now this is interesting. There's a lot of arcade games that had home computer and game console ports. This is a rare case of a game that started on the computer, I think on the Apple II by Broderbund. I remember playing this on the Apple II when I was a kid, and it eventually got ported to a bunch of other systems, including its own standalone arcade system. So it's using two of these SN76489 chips. These are TI sound chips that were, I think, used in the TI-99-4A and is part of the sound system of the Sega Genesis, but the Sega Genesis also has a Yamaha sound chip. So let's take a look. We have a bunch of songs. How about Mission 2? That sounds kind of cool. 
All right, so let's download that. Go into my working directory. Let's see. Ah, so I have 06 mission. Let's see. Now I should be able to say VGM2TXT and say 06 mission 2.vgz. Start time, end time. I'm just hitting return, hoping it will do the whole file. File written. Okay, what did it write? Oh, it turned it into a text file. Let's see what's on the text file. More. That's what I meant. Ah, so here a nice human readable format. It tells us all sorts of things about the header. Let's see. Tells us total length, the clock rate that it's running the SN76496 at. That will be 2 megahertz. It's telling us there's two of them. And we can see the basic structure here. So we wait a certain number of samples. And quite conveniently, the VGM2TXT program tells us how many milliseconds that is. And then we send some data to the chip. And, oh, it's even telling us what the data is doing. Now, on the SN76496, you don't have to specify a register and data separately. There's basically just one register, so you just write bytes to it. And here, oh, it's telling us there's SN76496 number 0 and number 1. So remember, there's two chips. It looks like it's mostly using 1, but it's also using zeros. And we have volume change commands and tone change commands that are doing various things. So the basic structure is you send a command, you wait. You send a command, you wait. Now, these very small wait times, I don't know if those are meant to be musical per se. It may have just been that somebody was measuring the data going to the chip and that's the amount of time between the times that the data were sent. It might be necessary to keep these. It might be that the chip can only handle data at a certain rate. But in some cases, it may be possible to skip some of these smaller sample wait periods. Although if you did a lot of that, eventually the timing would probably get weird. So who knows? Notice it's using two different hex codes. It's using hex 30 to address chip 1 and hex 50 to address chip 0. Let's go back to the website and sort by systems. How about the Neo Geo? Is that in here? No, not Neo Geo Pocket, not Neo Geo CD. Let me just use an old-fashioned Neo Geo. All right, YM2610. That's the most complicated of this series of chips that Yamaha made. It's the most advanced. Let's see what sort of stuff we have here. Oh, Metal Slug. Let's check out Metal Slug. How about stage one? Okay, let's download stage one. All right, do I need to actually type VGM to TXT, hit return, and then type the file name, or can I put the file name here? Let's find out. VGZ. Ah, okay, took the file name from the command prompt there. Start end, file written. All right, so let's take a look at this text file. All right, so we're using a YM2610. So where is that? Ah, here we go. Clock speed, it's running at 8 megahertz. Oh, and now it's telling us something about data blocks. Oh, this might get long and complicated because the YM2610 can actually play back sample data, instruments with sample data, and sound effects with sample data. So it's telling us about various blocks. Ah, I guess here it's turning the various AD PCM channels that sampled sound data on and off, doing all sorts of stuff here. Ah, we're setting up some voices, it looks like. So slot 0, slot 2, that's kind of the registers that we're sending to, I guess. And we have channels that we can send different things to. Wow, lots of stuff here. Here we're sending an FNUM to channel 2, whatever that is. Ah, oh, we're selecting some algorithms. I saw that flying by. Amplitude modulation is disabled. There's SSG EG, I guess that's envelope generator flags. 
So, oh, the SSG, I think this is like a square wave generator that's designed to be backwards compatible with some earlier Yamaha and other sound chips. All sorts of stuff going on in here. And between all of these things, there's various weight commands. So that's all kinds of fun.